Okay, now we're, we're going to hear from Catherine Gallagher, if you're there. Thank you. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me um, and giving me the opportunity to speak before this very honorable jury. In light of the potential breadth of the topic that I have, I will provide testimony that demonstrates the various fora and means by which the United States supports, directly and indirectly, Israel and its military and shields Israel from those intergovernmental mechanisms intended to ensure compliance with international law and accountability for its breaches. I will use my time to briefly provide an overview of U.S. military aid to Israel, an overview of the U.S. history of the use of vetoes at the Security Council, and also the threat of the use of a veto at the Security Council, because that is an important dynamic, and briefly discuss the specific recent role of the United States at the Human Rights Council, in particular in relation to the fact-finding missions established after Operation Castled and after the attack on the Gaza-bound flotilla in, 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 international, in international waters. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, I'm also giving these comments bearing in mind that the Russell Tribunal has ha heard much testimony of the specific violations, has also heard um, testimony previously about some of the complicity in particular context in, and specifically in the corporate context. So first on U.S. military aid to Israel. Since the creation of Israel, the United States has provided approximately $115 billion in bilateral assistance to Israel. Most of this aid has come in the form of military assistance. The United States phased out economic aid in the mid-1990s. For a comprehensive overview of U.S. military aid to Israel, I commend to the jury and seek to enter, enter into evidence the following two reports. U.S. Foreign Aid to Israel by the Congressional Research Service, and U.S. Military Aid to Israel, Policy Implications and, op and Options by the U.S. Uh, Campaign to End the Occupation. Both of these reports were presented in March 2012. Right now, I will highlight some of the main aspects of the policies and practices regarding the military aid and the impact of that aid on Israel. First. Israel is the largest recipient of military aid and the second largest recipient of total U.S. aid worldwide. Israel receives 60% of the UN, U.S. foreign military finance funding. In 2007, the United States and Israel entered into a memorandum of understanding by which the United States agreed to provide $30 billion in military aid over 10 years. For the current fiscal year, Israel received approximately $3.1 billion in military aid through the FMF program. The FMF grants constitute between 18 and 22 percent of the overall Israel, Israeli defense budget. Israel also receives benefits available, not available to most other countries. These include that Israel is the only country that can make military purchases from its own defense manufacturers. Currently, Israel makes approximately 26% of its military purchases from Israeli manufacturers. Unlike other countries, Israel can use military assistance for research and development purposes. Israel is now ranked as one of the top 10 suppliers of arms worldwide with exports between 2003 and 2010 totaling $12 billion. All assistance to Israel is delivered in the first 30 days of the fiscal year. Most other countries receive aid in installments. The aid that Israel receives is transferred into an interest-bearing account with the Federal Reserve Bank. While Israel cannot use this interest to um, procure 
defense articles within Israel, it can use this to pay down the debt to the United States. In addition to FMF grants, Israel receives funds from the annual defense appropriation bills. This year, the requests range between 100 and $168 million um, in funding for the joint U.S.-Israeli military defense programs. A 2008 U.S. law mandates that, that the United States president carry out an assessment of the extent to which Israel maintains, quote, a qualitative military edge over any threat to it. Through this QME, the qualitative military edge, because of this, through the Arms Export Control Act, there has to be a certification that any sale of arms to another country in the, in the Middle East does not negatively impact Israel's qualitative military edge. Israel is the largest recipient of military equipment through the Excess Defense Articles Program. From 2001 through early 2012, Israel received more than $330 million in EDAs. So this is that military equipment that had been purchased for the U.S. military, but is no longer required by the U.S. military. I think as we see the, the wars wind down, the first in Iraq, Iraq and now in Afghanistan, we'll be seeing an increase in EDA, um, in excess uh, defense articles available for um, gifting to other states. There have also been other means by which Israel has received military assistance historically. These include weapon-specific forms of military assistance provided to Israel or for joint weapon development. This includes loan guarantees and circumstance-specific military grants, such as before the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. Furthermore, the U.S. maintains a stockpile of weapons for its own use in Israel, which is valued at approximately $800 million. The U.S. can allow Israel to use the stockpile in emergency situations and granted Israel such access during the 2006 Israel-Lebanon War. As detailed in other sessions of the tribunal, the U.S. supplied weapons and military equipment have been implicated in gross human rights violations and violations of international law, including war crimes. Furthermore, this is in violation of U.S. laws, such as the Foreign Assistance Act and the Arms Export Control Act. Overall, there is a requirement that U.S. military aid only be used for legitimate self-defense and be used to advance human rights. There have been numerous documented cases, again, that the jury has already heard about that, that one may argue do not fall into these categories, specifically in relation to the use of tear gas, cluster muni munitions, militarized bulldozers, and of course the weapons themselves. There have been very few examples of any kind of punishment or, or change in policy um, in relation to violations of the obligations of the U.S. Of, and Israel in the use of, of weapons. One example was in the first Bush administration when loan guarantees were withheld in 1991 and 92 due to settlement activity. We saw in the Reagan administration a six-year ban on the use of cluster munitions um, after the use in Lebanon with documented cases of U.S. cluster bombs in Lebanon in 2006, we did see some requests um, going to the Secretary of State to review the use of cluster munitions, but we haven't seen any kind of stated change of, of policy. Overall, the result of the, of the failure to punish or otherwise express some serious uh, reservations about how U.S. military aid is being used, there has been no disincentive for Israel to stop committing war crimes and other violations in, of international law. I will now move on briefly to U.S. veto and threat of veto at the United Nations. As has just been said, um, the United <laughs> States has used its, its veto power in 82 cases, and approximately half of these instances 
have been to protect Israel from condemnation, including in relation to suspected war crimes. Since the mid-1970s, the U.S. has used its veto power more than any other permanent member of the Security Council. In addition to using its veto, the U.S. has also effectively blocked reservation, resolutions by threatening to use its veto. This was the case in regard to the Palestinian bid for statehood. The last resolution vetoed by the United States was the February 2011 resolution calling upon Israel to end, quote, illegal settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. The draft resolution specifically affirmed that the Fourth Geneva Convention applied to East Jerusalem and other Palestinian and other Arab other Palestinian and Arab territory occupied since 1967. This draft resolution was framed within the context of prior Security Council resolutions that the United States had signed on to, including Security Council resolutions 242, 338, 1515, and 1850. These prior resolutions endorsed the Quartet's roadmap that called for the freeze of all settlement activity and the dismantlement of these settler outposts, which we've just heard about, built since March 2001, and endorsed the two-state solution, a theme that we continually hear now. More than 100 states sponsored this February 2011 um, resolution. The Lebanese representative introduced the resolution, citing, among other points, the January 2011 demolition of part of the Shepherd Hotel in East Jerusalem to make way for construction of approximately 400 housing units, a settlement project of U.S. citizen Irving Moskowitz. In explaining the, the veto, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Susan Rice stated that direct negotiations in the framework of a U.S.-led peace process was the U.S. preferred course. In her comments, she highlighted the impact of the settlements on Israel's security, first and foremost. Then she spoke about how the settlements also um, broke down the trust and somehow made the two-state solution and the peace process more difficult. Rice was followed by the U.K. representative speaking on behalf of the U.K., France, and Germany, who also was concerned about the peace process, but stated unequivoc unequivocally, each country voted in favor of the draft Security Council resolution because our views on settlements, including in East Jerusalem, are clear. They are illegal under international law, are an obstacle to peace, and constitute a threat to a two-state solution. All settlement activity, including in East Jerusalem, shall cease immediately. Riyad Mansour, the Palestinian rest, uh, representative, stated after the vote, the proper message that should have been sent by the Security Council to Israel, the occupying power, is that its contempt of international law and the international community will no longer be tolerated. We fear, however, that the message sent today may be one that encourages further Israeli intransigence and impunity. And as anyone who's been to Jerusalem in the time since February 2011 has seen, there is just a continued um, overtaking of property, um, Palestinian property for settlement activities. Now, there was precedent for this U.S. veto, including its 1995 veto of a draft resolution that affirmed, affirmed, that land annexed in East Jerusalem is occupied territory, and such annexation is illegal under international law, as well as two uh, vetoes in 1997 of resolutions calling upon Israel to cease building settlements, including in East Jerusalem and the Har Homa settlement. Again, if anyone has been to the region since 1997, you see that Har Homa a settlement is now a very large neighborhood, bypass roads, tunnels, so the terrain has literally been changed since the time of the U.S. vetoes in 1997. It should be recalled that in 1980, the United States supported and voted in favor of three Security uh, Council resolutions, and I would commend to everyone to go back and look at resolutions 465, 476, and 478, which in very clear language, speak about the illegality of settlement activity in East Jerusalem, state great 
concern about moving a settler population into these areas which are occupied territory. So there, at one point, had been more support um, for condemnation of illegal activities in East Jerusalem. Among the many other resolutions involving Israel that the U.S. has, has vetoed are numerous resolutions calling for self-determination for the Palestinian, Palestinians in the late 1970s and early 1980s, numerous resolutions related to Israeli attacks on Lebanese civilians in the invasion of or occupation of, of parts of Lebanon. Beginning in 1976, there were numerous resolutions vetoed related to the building of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory. Again, this trend has continued. Um, the U.S. has also vetoed resolutions calling for Israel to protect Muslim holy places. In the last decade, the United States has vetoed otherwise blocked or delayed resolutions condemning the killing of a U.N. worker and the destruction of the World Food Program warehouse condemning the building of the wall, and condemning incursions into Gaza, including the 2009 um, Operation Cast Lead. Finally, a, a topic that wasn't listed specifically, but I think that we have to um, also focus on, is the United States and the UN Human Rights Council. In addition to using its veto powers at the Security Council, the United States has greatly impacted the work of the UN Human Rights Council in the context of accountability for alleged violations of international law by Israel. Two recent examples bear mention, and I won't go into much detail here knowing I have a limited amount of time, but those are the 2009 fact-finding mission on the attack on Gaza led by Richard Goldstone and the 2010 fact-finding mission to investigate the Israeli attack on the Gaza-bound humanitarian flotilla. I should note that the U.S. Uh, joined the Human Rights Council in 2009, and its first session was the one where the Goldstone Report was discussed. Through the public statements at the time of each mission's establishment, or at the time of the issuance of thorough fact-based reports, the United States has undercut the legitimacy and impact of both missions and their findings. Reports, U.S. cables released through WikiLeaks related to the Goldstone Commission, and documents related, released through a Freedom of Information Act case related to the 2010 Gaza attack further demonstrate that the United States used its considerable political power to garner opposition to both fact-finding missions or at least blunt their impact as best they could. In both cases, the fact, factual findings of each mission contributed greatly to the historical record of each event and provided documentary evidence of both the human impact of the 2008-2009 war in Gaza and the attack on the flotilla in international waters, as well as the role and responsibility of Israel. U.S. direct actions or pressure in the context of the work of the Human Rights Council ultimately, however, ensured that neither mission would lead to the legal accountability necessary to curtail impunity and serve as an adequate deterrent to future violations. As I said, there are a number of WikiLeaks cables specifically on the Goldstone Commission, and if you type into WikiLeaks Goldstone, you get um, hundreds of, of um, hits, and I would really recommend uh, the jury look at some of those, and I can provide them in a separate dossier. But none of this is secret. The Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Organizations stated in April uh, this year in Miami, the administration's, and, and talked about the administration's far-reaching efforts to normalize Israelis, Israel's status in and across the UN and broader multilateral system and to counter head-on efforts of its delegitimization. She also spoke about the ironclad commitment by President Obama to support Israel across the UN system and ensure that Israel's security is never compromised. And that, I think, sums up what you see when you look at the combined record of US military assistance the financial assistance, the diplomatic assistance, the political assistance. Thank you. Michael, Michael, you have a question? 
Yes, I, I have a question uh, because you've clearly delineated the use of the veto. And what I've been suggesting is obviously the veto should be abolished. Now, I'm not saying that alone. There's a substantial body of opinion uh, amongst member states of the, United State, uh, of the United Nations that that should happen. However, I realize real politic is rather different. One of the problems was thrown up last year when a huge majority of people, of member states, voted in favor of Palestine being admitted to UNESCO. What did the US do? Immediately threatened to withdraw financial aid to UNESCO because it was said that George Bush had passed legislation which prohibited money of that kind going in that direction. Now there's a bigger question because I think the veto is at the core of this as well as the Israeli lobby or the Zionist lobby to be more precise. In order to get a vote through to stop the veto, change the veto, enlarge the Security Council, and democratize the whole organization, the US will threaten to withdraw its aid to the UN. Now, do you see this as the core problem that we're facing? We can talk law all night, but actually at the bottom line is, if the US doesn't want it, they're just not going to cough up the money. And how do we get around that? Well, I'm, I'm not really in a position to say whether the U.S. would really withdraw all money. Um, one thing that's interesting when you look at the cables, particularly around the Human Rights Council session in September of 2009, this was the early stage of the Obama administration. This was a period of, quote, re-engagement with the international community and specifically with the United Nations. The, these cables reveal a list of... Um, key priorities. And the priorities range from, well, first, of course, is get back to the negotiating table so we can move forward with this peace process. Um, on behalf of Israel, it talks about the need to keep Goldstone and the Goldstone Report in Geneva. Keep it away from the Security Council, keep it away from the ICC. Um, it also then, lower down the list, talks about the concern that the whole Goldstone process will overwhelm U.S. efforts to re-engage with the United Nations, to re-engage with the Arab world. You know, this was the time of the Cairo talk and re-engagement. So I, I don't know where we are three years down the line um, with the Arab Spring, with the United Nations and the U.S. continuing to have a fairly heavy hand in the U.N whether the U.S. would be really willing to give up that venue by pulling out funding. Um, I think it can certainly use that more in a targeted way, again, against specific U.N. agencies, mandates, mandate holders, rather than going all the way to withhold funding from the U.N. But that, again, I'm not an expert on, on whether that's really a possibility. That's enough. Here we go. Is there Marie? Eh, merci. Eh, au sujet de, de l'UNESCO, hmm, puisque je l'ai vécu, eh, eh, sur place, bon, ça a été une bataille que nous avons beaucoup travaillé pendant des années, les différentes délégations à, à l'UNESCO. Et hmm, la deuxième votation, donc, a donné par... Bon, je recommence. <rire> oui. Au sujet de l'UNESCO, donc c'était une longue bataille menée par, par beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de délégations euh, de, 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 de presque toute la planète en faveur d'un État palestinien. Et quand nous avons gagné ce, cette bataille, mais bien gagné en plus, j'avais remercié à à, à tous les pays qui ont donné ce, cette victoire, et disant que bon, l'UNESCO est évidemment la réserve morale de la planète et les, les Nations Unies ne le sont plus. La réaction des États-Unis était violente, avec tous ceux qui avaient voté 
pour un État palestinien. Non seulement ça, comme vous venez de le dire, l'aide la, économique supplémentaire que, que les États-Unis accordaient à, 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 à l'UNESCO a été radicalement supprimé, supprimé. Ce, qui a, ce qui a créé beaucoup de problèmes à l'UNESCO, parce que l'UNESCO a dû annuler une quantité de programmes auxquels il ne peut plus souvenir, surtout quand il s'agit des affaires sociales, de la lutte contre la pauvreté, la lutte pour, pour l'inclusion sociale dans, dans les pays émergents et dans les pays pauvres. Alors tout, tout ça, dans une puissance impériale comme les États-Unis, et qui parle tout le temps des de droits de l'homme, des de démocraties, etc., c'est un pays qui, qui ne respecte pas du tout les droits de l'homme. C'est une posture complètement abstraite, intellectuelle, politiquement correcte, mais dans les faits, comme ce qui est arrivé à l'UNESCO, il a enlevé les États-Unis la, la possibilité d'aider au développement des pays émergents. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I'm a somewhat typical American in this regard and that I don't speak French, but I had your comment translated and I don't think there's really much I need to add to it. Um, it I think it, your comment really speaks for itself that while the United States does speak as a country that respects and sees itself as a leader on human rights, it very often doesn't live up to that standard. Are there any qu other questions? Thank yes. Um, Catherine, thank you very much for your excellent report. I would like to ask a question about Israel's um, over 200 nuclear weapons. Um, when Mordecai Vanunu uh, told the world 26 years ago that Israel had a nuclear weapons program, we all know he paid a high price. He sits today within Jerusalem, unable to leave the country. A wonderful inspiration to all of us of the power of having to tell the truth and the price that often has to be paid. My question to you is, why does President Obama, who has promised us that his vision is a nuclear-free world, and his administration, why do they allow Israel to threaten Iran with war when Iran has signed a nuclear non-proliferation treaty and doesn't have nuclear weapons, as did not Iraq, a country destroyed by America and the NATO forces? Why does the president allow Netanyahu to threaten Iran when Israel itself sits on over 200 nuclear weapons, has led the nuclear arms race in the Middle East, continues to lead the nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Why does the American president not say to Netanyahu, enough is enough, start getting rid of your nuclear weapons and sign the non-proliferation treaty? Um. It's, it's an excellent question and, and an excellent comment. Um, in terms of the reason for the why, I don't have a concrete answer, but I think the list of reasons that we heard in the last session of the importance of the U.S.-Israeli relationship as a two-way street um, is a, a large reason for this. It's a continuation of, of U.S. policy in some ways through a proxy, although at this point the relationship who's leading and who's following um, that can, can shift. Um, but certainly we do see an absolute disconnect in the way that a nuclear-free world is talked about. Stefan? Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, the United States is a democracy which cannot be said as well for Israel. In that democracy, is there a group of legal experts, professors of law, who will be strong enough to put forward the uh, idea that the United States cannot continue to be subservient 
to the interests of Israel? Are there such legal experts in some universities? Are there some newspapers which will take the position that it is not in the interest of the United States to continue to be bound? And this particularly in the light of the fact that more and more countries in the world, UNESCO was an example of that, will try to prevent Israel from continuing to go illegal. I would be very interested if you can tell us about what legal forms resistance to the present U.S. policy towards Israel has taken in the last years. Thank you. Sure. Um, I can speak about the legal, but I might start somewhere else rather than just in the legal realm, which is one that I, I come from. Um, and I would speak about the need for a larger movement. And in that regard, I do think we've seen progress. We see progress with this tribunal and the attendance that it has. I do think we've seen a slight shift in newspapers, particularly in light of the 2006 Lebanon war the uh, Operation Cast Lead, the flotilla attack, which included the, the death of one US citizen among the nine. Um, you do see, not a huge number, but in mainstream media, more times where Palestinians are humanized, given names, given identities, given emotion. That is not something that we were seeing very much of 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So I do think there is a shift in the public um, discourse which could enable maybe some of the political pressure uh, to build. I, again, I don't think the tide has turned, but we're seeing a movement and that is encouraging. In terms of, of legal actions, um, for the funding, it's very difficult to challenge, but there are ways um, that, again, more through advocacy efforts, whether it's the Leahy Amendment, which can call into question specific pieces of funding um, to particular units. If there's a history of human rights violations, this is one tool that some activists with legal assistance have, have been exploring. Um, we have had, at my organization, the Center for Constitutional Rights, a number of cases challenging home demolitions, um, targeted killing. Um, I would have to say we have not been successful in U.S. courts in large part due to immunity arguments. And in the case that we brought against Caterpillar on behalf of the family of Rachel Corey and, and five Palestinian families, what was interesting in that case is we lost it on something known as the political question doctrine. And the Ninth Circuit said that this case, because of US aid to Israel, and the fact that the sale of these militarized bulldozers was reimbursed through US aid, that this could somehow be um, an indirect challenge to US policy, and thus it was political. So we lost that case. Um, I would also build on what was said in the, the the previous session about US policies and Israel being a test case for some of those policies. We challenged a targeted killing in Gaza in the Eldaraj neighborhood in 2002. And one of the first questions that um, the appeals court here in New York asked was, are you saying that it would be illegal to kill Osama bin Laden? So I think um, it's it's challenging to, to um, to bring to bear the legal weight um, for a number of reasons, but I think you will definitely be seeing more cases, whether in US courts or in foreign courts, to challenge some of these practices. Thank you very much, Catherine Gallagher.